Hey guys, Jonathan here. Saul 117. Here you go. A little Bible study, Jonathan Fibonacci style. If I wanted to be cute, we can kind of talk about some Dr. Seuss, some wise, witty prescriptions living from the good doctor. But you know, sometimes um, anybody who watches this channel knows that, uh, well, I, you know, this channel is about all kinds of things. You know, there's, um, well, just look for yourself. Today we're going to talk about something kind of weird. Here you go, Pharisee yeast. And what the fuck is Pharisee yeast? And, you know, notice, I guess we're just going to kind of get right to it. I want to kind of talk about um, just sort of an old school Bible study. And this is the Pharisees looking for a loophole and Luke 10. And, um, and then Jesus is curt. What does that mean? Are you ready to rough it? And he's talking about traveling light. And, um, and then this is, I want to talk about Bible study for a second. I want to, before I, I talk about Pharisee yeast and... Um, some of the things that Jesus is saying to the Pharisees um, really, you know, Kurt. I mean, that's the... Um, so here you go. Here's the Bible study uh, topic of the day is, is Jesus nice? Uh, and I say that because, you know, I've been a Christian most of my life and I've gone through... If you, just like in your faith, you know, there's all kinds of journeys and valleys and, you know, there's a reason why Psalms 23 talks about enemies and adversaries and triumph over your adversaries and here he is jesus the christ talking to the pharisees and using the expression um pharisee yeast so there's a couple things i want to talk about here um and you can read this for yourself luke 10 through 12 and um you know one of the the most recent I guess evolution, that's what this channel is all about, is the, the evolution of Jonathan Fibonacci or just Jonathan. You can call me John if, you're re, if we're really good friends, but let's just start with Jonathan. Um, one of the things that I have noticed kind of a weakness in myself is over the years, I kind of have gotten away from just reading uh, the Bible in, in terms of just two or three, four chapters um, uh, at a time. And there's this tendency if you're from if you are a Christian maybe you're like me where you sort of just sort of find maybe a psalm songs whatever you want to call it, and you sort of get in the habit of uh, just sort of staying in the same place in the Bible and so one of the things that I have done is of course I love the psalms and the psalms are just sort of ready-made prayers of spiritual warfare there's a lot of worship psalms uh, there's warfare songs there's tribulation um, they're um, talking about fresh oil, being uncompromising, talking about the wicked. And do we use expressions like that anymore? Well, one thing that I want to talk about is just reading the Bible, um, much like you would read a book. You know, maybe pick up Luke 10 and read chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 at one sitting. You know, uh, recently I read 1 Kings. The whole book uh, took me, you know, a couple, three, four hours and I was I was really amazed. Number one of how wonderful First Kings is, and how it's a it's a it's a wonderful book for men, um, and even women. Um, but it's it's a it's First Kings is a is a book about wisdom and about kingship and about uh, about idolatry when men really put other things in front of God like women and and money and status and what real grace looks like. And if you want to know what real grace looks like. Read the book of 1 Kings, and that's grace. And you know, one of my pet peeves uh, is when people confuse grace and mercy. You know, a lot of times, like Psalms 57 says, Be merciful and gracious to me, O God. Well, there's a difference between God's mercy and God's grace or God's empowerment. So that's a long way, kind of a long intro to... Um, talk about, you know, one of the things that happens to immature Christians or uh, Christians that are led astray is we really, number one, we just stop reading the Bible. Um, and I am amazed how many Christians or people who profess Christianity or people who think they're believers or uh, profess believing in Jesus the Christ or whatever your denomination is, how many people don't read the Bible and even how many churches just don't read the Bible. And if they do read the Bible, they kind of have their little certain uh, verses that they love. You know, I grew up uh, in a very fundamentalist background, and that was one thing that we got caught up in. There was about, uh, I don't know, about 10 verses we built an entire religion around 
I'm talking about the Church of Christ, maybe you're Baptist, or it doesn't matter. Every denomination does that, and that's what makes a denomination a denomination, uh, is we sort of find our little safe, affirming, uh, fill-in-the-blank, um, predictable verses, and we kind of stay there. And then we hire pastors that kind of reaffirm those past, reaffirm affirm those proof texts. And well, so that's a long way of saying get in the Word. And one of the one of the traits of loving God or 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 pursuing His presence is wanting to learn His Word and letting that Word in your life. In fact, John 15 is an entire book, John 15, about letting the Word in our lives. Uh, and then the book, the Gospel of Luke, talks about uh, the importance of the literal Word in our, in, our, in our prayers, in our lives. And one of the things, like if you're going through like a hardship or a battle, putting the Word in your prayers, and sometimes just praying the Word, maybe praying Psalms 91, uh, out loud over your problems instead of complaining the problems. So, a couple things is number one, hello, John Fibonacci from the woods, Saul 17, 117, 117. You're like, what does that mean? When is he going to talk about the joyfully sing part? Well, I'll talk about joyfully sing, and there's definitely a place for that, but I read Luke 8, 9, 10, um, really kind of focused on verse 12, if I can find it. Maybe someday I'll have a really good YouTube editor and we can kind of make these videos super cool and high production value. But sometimes I just like to go old school and just really talk about the Word of God. And that's one of the things that I love. Um, And one thing that you'll notice with me is you'll notice um, is some of the phraseology of the Bible. Like, for example, you're worth more than a million canaries. I mean, where else are you going to find that? Well, so... Number one is let the Word in your life. I mean, Joyce Meyer says we're not going to have victory in our lives if we don't let the Word in our life. And and so here we go. Back to Luke 11. Kind of here is the Bible study. and, And is Jesus nice? And I say that because one of the things that I observe in just kind of, I'm going to use a technical term, kind of a modern day Christianity or Christendom, is this attitude that somehow Jesus was this really nice guy in khakis that was married, had 2.3 kids, lived in suburbia, went to Disneyland, like everything that the modern church, pick your denomination, believes. I'm like, that wasn't even Jesus. I mean, Jesus was unmarried. He traveled around, didn't have a home. He was technically homeless. And everywhere he went, he ran into what he's calling the Pharisee yeast or Pharisee phoniness. And then he was very very harsh with them, talking about um, how hopeless they are and how they were constantly looking for loopholes and how, you know, they, they would always ask questions in some sort of like lawyer-like way. And the reason why that's important is because if Jesus the Christ dealt with evil or evil people, well, you and I will too. And it's really interesting how often we have whitewashed this Jesus the Christ man, this character, the the Son of God, the Supreme. And we have kind of made him just a really nice guy that just sort of, I don't know, went to Easter and Easter services and and, um, was... Anyway, so read the Bible and let the Word in your life. And today, I was struck with, well, number one is... The Bible says that we are worth more than canaries. But secondly, I was really overwhelmed with um, just exactly um, the battle that Jesus faced from the religious leaders and how they came at him and how they were um, really lovers of the law that they themselves didn't keep. And, And so why is that relevant? And you're like, John Fibonacci, we get it. Saul 117, make it brief. we got Facebook to check. Uh, maybe you have your problems, you have some bills, and you're like, okay, I'm giving this John Fibonacci some 10 minutes to, to give me a Bible study. And all he's telling me is to make time for the Word. Well, if that's all you get, then that was a good 10 minutes. Hope you enjoyed this. Secondly, in your Christian walk or in our Christian walk, if we don't read the Word and we don't realize exactly 
what Jesus and his disciples went through, uh, or even Paul, if you read the First uh, Corinthians, the twelfth chapter, or maybe it's the Second Corinthians, the twelfth, you know, where where Paul is talking about all of his battles that he struggled with when he was beaten and he was homeless and he was stoned. I mean, when we really get into the Word, we see that there is evil and there's wickedness and there's wicked systems. In fact, the Bible says that our battle is not really against flesh and blood. It's against evil and that there are evil systems. I've talked repeatedly about how uh, the modern-day court system is an evil entity and how uh, it, it is a modern-day Auschwitz and how most churches don't even really talk about evil anymore. And they don't talk about evil because, frankly, they're not really in love with Jesus the Christ. They're in love with mammon, the systems of this world. Well, let's talk about that. And, of course, I'm not going to read um, all of Luke 10, but just some of the things that the Bible says, as silly and as cliche and as, as naive as this sounds, um, I mean, it's amazing the things that we can learn. For example, it says, If you live in wide-eyed wonder and belief, your body is filled with light. And then it talks about, If you're squinty-eyed and with greed and distrust, your body will start to resemble the consequences of that. And do we really even talk about how our bodies are really a manifestation of our spirit? Do we even have, have a place for that? Do we talk about the Pharisees' phoniness? You know, when Ferguson happened, I was really amazed at how many Christians didn't even speak up uh, about what's happening to black young men every day in our cities. In fact, in Austin, Texas, there was a 17-year-old unarmed black man. He was naked, shot, dead, done. And the only people who protest were just his family. There were no Christians um, that joined that cause. So here you go. Jesus dealt with evil. We will deal with evil. And when we really look at the narrative and we really read some of this stuff, for example, it talks about selfishness. It talks about being filled with yourself. That's what happens when you're filled when you fill your barn with self. And and who talks about selfishness and how um, you know, on one hand, John 10, 10 talks about the abundant life. And I think anybody who's been a Christian for more than uh, a year can talk about a season of where God has blessed us with abundance. I certainly can. I mean, God built, built a, uh, I ran a finance company. God took it from $3 and 58 cents. Um, we're now, you know, just my tax bills alone are intimidating. I mean, I pray about tax bills now where I used to pray and then, you know, how that changed and, and so any, any person who has, has walked with God knows that there are seasons. And in these seasons, especially seasons of lack or seasons of difficulty, one of the spirits that you'll encounter is the religious spirit or the Pharisee spirit. And when you go into the Bible and you read how evil came against Jesus, you start to recognize how evil come against you or how, how you can start, you can look at conversations you have with friends and they don't have to be religious scholars of how, uh, for example, um, you know, I've noticed that, you know, one thing that, that, that I've noticed really in the, like the last 10 years, just in my own journey of that there is this assumption in Christianity that it's always John 10, 10. It's always abundance. It's always wonderful. It's always affluence. And I'm like, no, th- there are seasons, in fact, years. And, and some of God's greatest um, ambassadors went through unspeakable challenges. And one of the challenges we'll face is this a thing called Pharisee yeast. So I'm going to kind of wrap this video up. You know, I want to do more Bible studies. And I don't want them to be too long, but at the same time, I want to cover some ground. I want to introduce some, I want to reintroduce the Bible to you. Maybe you're a new Christian. Maybe you're not even in America. Maybe you're like, what is Pharisee yeast? Well, before you um, have that conversation with that religious scholar or that person who 
is coming at you with loopholes and condemnation and criticism. And because the Pharisee spirit is is always about crit- criticizing you and giving themselves loopholes without accountability while never giving you an ounce of mercy. And Christians love to talk about mercy, but the Pharisees only like um, the notion of condemnation and criticism. Uh, and they use the law as a weapon. Because even the Bible says that the, that the law killeth, but the Spirit gives life. So I'm going to wrap this video up. I want to keep these videos brief. I want them to be informative. Of course, I want you to, uh, wherever you're at, I want you to, um, if you leave some comments, tell me where you're at. Tell me, um, you know, what did you notice in Luke 10 or Luke 11 or Luke 12? Or maybe you read John 15 for the first time and you're like, yeah, I really see what this Jonathan guy is talking about with letting the word into our life. And, you know, I think one, one of the reasons why we don't let the word in our lives is because we fear what it says. And that itself is something that needs to be addressed. And maybe sometimes, maybe in your own prayer life, you can take that concern to God. And you can say, God, you know, show me who you are. And if you're like me, a lot of your Christian journey is going to begin with unlearning the Pharisee yeast. And that might take one year. You might have come from such a legalistic background. Maybe you're like, maybe you're like me and you came from such a, a Pharisee yeast background that it might take five years to really break that spirit off. And there's one thing that's going to do it, the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So, you know, I'm not against keeping your, your, uh, your favorite Psalms handy. You know, I mean, of course, I carry this and I quote that, you know, His truth and His faithfulness are a shield and a buckler, and I pray the Psalms over my life. Um, but one thing that I have noticed in my own journey that I, that I want to caution you against is don't get in the ha- habit of, or be careful that you don't get in the habit of reading the same verses over and over and over, and, and you kind of squeeze out the story of God. And one of the things that the story of God will talk about, you'll talk about Jesus came against evil. And the evil was the mammon system, the religious system. And the religious system and the mammon system, uh, you ever notice that Christians are just as political? They probably care more about the, the election than they do homeless people. In fact, most Christians care more about their interest rate on their mortgage or the fees on their credit card than they do their brother, which is really interesting because if you read the Bible, Genesis, the sin that Cain um, was guilty of was he didn't care about his brother. So take some of these thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Leave some comments. I'd love, I'd love to see how this journey or how this channel is growing. If you like this content, you'd like to contribute to it, just go to PayPal, put Americano417 at gmail.com. Uh, excuse me, go to PayPal, drop me some jack, 85 bucks, 55 bucks, 5 bucks, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 5,000, I don't care. Just go to PayPal, put Americano417 at gmail.com. Just like the coffee, Americano417 at gmail.com. Tell me where you are, what your thoughts are, and happy reading. And maybe there's something you find, found that you like. Let me know. Maybe you're just going to get caught up with that phraseology that you are worth more than a million canaries. And then, of course, we'll kind of close out on this. I love this one. It says, The resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, pretending life. It's adventurous ex- expect, or it, it's adventurously expecting greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and, confer- and, conforms, and confirms who we really are. So maybe you don't have any prayers. Maybe things are going really good with you. I love how the, the Message Bible says, our posture with God is an adventurously expectant posture greeting God with a childlike, eyes open, what's next, Papa? That's from Romans 8. The solution to life on God's terms. Be careful of the Pharisee yeast, because remember the quote that I love, Be careful 
the dragon you fight that you may become that dragon. So notice when you're around Pharisees, you start fighting like the Pharisees. Well, that's part of the Pharisee yeast. So learning to fight evil without letting that into your own spirit is its own um, own journey. It's, a, it's, a own, its own accomplishment. Um, and sometimes you just have to put boundaries and limitations on people who have the Pharisee yeast. Uh, in fact, you know, this, this morning I was just reading... You know, just reading the the the, the message over um, over uh, breakfast, and a person I've never talked to walked up to me and really had some criticism for <laughs> this uh, this version of the Bible, the New Testament in contemporary language. I thought that was interesting. You know, here I mean, I could have been reading Nietzsche or Carl Jung. I mean, these are all you know wise, intelligent people. But the Word of God is so powerful that even if you just read the Bible in public, it will offend people. And there's a reason, because there is evil and there is good. What's next, Papa? Americano417 at gmail.com. Man, I need a good editor. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Saul 117. 